Well, how's your faith today? Because I may do a test. I may test your faith. Are you ready? <laughs> it's tested every day. Really good to see you. Mahal <laughs> kita. We love you guys. Uh, we're called Life Church. And in John 10:10, 10, 10, it says that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Jesus says, I came that they may have life, say life, and have it abundantly. Like, abundantly is extreme. It's epic. All right, so that's Jesus. So he comes to bring life, eternal life. What is eternal life? That you may know God and Christ Jesus who he has sent. This is eternal life. So eternal life we think of out there, but actually it begins when we begin a relationship with God, eternal life. Life, church. We have a right relationship with God. This is life. We know him. Life, church. It's a life that thrives. It's a life that's supposed to be abundant. In contrast, to the life that we're meant to have, there is a thief that Jesus talks about who comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Destruction, theft, and murder. Anybody ever felt like your life has been more like that? Things stolen, destroyed, killed, but Jesus would say to you, in contrast to the thief that is a thief, he's a thief, he's a stealer, he's a killer, and he's a destroyer, Jesus says that he is a restorer. He is a reviver. He's generous. And he is somebody that wants to build, not destroy, build what is good for us. And I think that some of us, through stress, through our experience, and through disappointments, have moved into a constricted kind of a life. And we think that that's from God. This is how it is. But Jesus says, you are a son and a daughter, and I have come that you may have life abundantly. And some of us get confused because we're thinking, well, God, isn't it like, aren't you like this? Like, this seems like right. This is like. Are you, are you in this, this smallness that I'm feeling, this limitation? And I believe that God wants to adjust us and open, begin to open us up. And to have the discernment that that is not what he is saying to you. Clarity. I love clarity. I like to know sometimes we're ba bouncing back and forth and we're getting smaller and smaller but god i believe is saying to us that he wants us to get bigger and the word that i keep getting right this week and for a couple years now it's a personal word to me but it's also for our church i believe and that's the word expansive can you say expansive, expansive. you gotta put this one in your on your mirror <laughs> in your bathroom uh, it's a wonderful word and expansive means you have a capacity or a tendency to expand <laughs> like get greater and bigger 
And I love the second definition that I found. It says, expansive can be defined as a person who is relaxed and expressively communicative. <laughs> Does that make sense? You ever meet people like that? They just, ah, oh, and I could just tell you everything. We can talk for hours, and I'm chilled out, and I am, uh, it's, it's all good, right? That expansive person. And the reason I think that it's such a word for me is because I tend to... <laughs> because God just wants to take us. And, and, and I believe that, you know, they say when you're stressed, that actually you have limitations in... Your mind actually gets limited because the energy that you expend from that stress, whatever, why ever it's coming, comes in a lot of different ways really pulls away from you being who you're meant to be. Stress. I don't like it. <laughs> so, but I still have it sometimes. I was even talking with my wife yesterday about my issue with stress. Sometimes I'm like, I don't need this. I don't want it. There's no reason I should have it. But I still feel it. <laughs> and I'm getting smaller. But, but if you could, if we, when we don't have stress, isn't it amazing? You get creative ideas. You begin to dream. You, you enjoy your life more. And so I just, I'm believing that God wants to pull us, begin to pull us out of that stress, that constriction, and move us into creativity, into the life that he has for us. Amen. I love, one of my favorite parables is called the parable of the talents. Do you, you know this parable? Jesus shared this parable and it was about a master who entrusted three of his servants with a massive amount of money. So imagine, he went to Yannick, Alistair, uh, David. We'll pick you three. I love picking on people. I know everybody hates me to do this. But imagine these guys, they had a boss, and he came and he gave them two and a half million euros, a million and half a million. That's what, that's what a talent was. That's how much money were these five talents, two talents, and one talent. That's a big responsibility, isn't it? That'd be nice to be able to have that, but you know what? You got it, but it's not yours, right? <laughs> so it's not as fun then, is it? You're responsible for it, but it doesn't belong to you. And so he gives them this money, and it says that the one with five, the one with two and a half million euros, went and doubled their money, got, got five more talents. They went and traded and did whatever they did. I don't know, stock market or what, but they made, made the money back. It said that the second one did the same. Uh, you could be one. You, it doesn't matter who's what, okay? I, know, pick, I don't want to pick on David. But the third one didn't do a good job. He didn't double the money, right? So he got, what did he do? Do you guys remember? Anybody remember what did he do? Yeah, he, he dug a hole and he buried it. And so when the master came back, it says that he spoke to the first servant. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over little, a little, two and a half million. Whoa, I will set you over much. Then he went to the second one, same thing. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little and I will set you over much. And the third servant who dug the hole and hid it, he was not very happy, this master. He says, you wicked and slothful servant, you should have at least invested. You should have at least put it in the stock market or into the bank. You might have got like half of a percent at, yeah, in Bitcoin. <laughs> if you would have at least put it in that, you would have gained interest. You, you know? But do you see what happened? This third servant, because he hid it, he didn't actually give what he should have given back. He actually ended up stealing from the master. I don't know if you ever heard that about this parable. But because he did not get back what was just natural to come, he was actually stealing from the master. And so he says, take the one talent from him and give it to the one who had multiplied the five. And so the truth within this parable is that we have this 
calling and this responsibility to manage and maximize what we've been entrusted with. And, um, and what I think is also interesting about this is that the outcome of good management of what you've been entrusted with is more to manage and be entrusted with. Now, for me, what I want, if I entrust something, if I've been given something and I've been entrusted with and maximize it, I would like a holiday. <laughs> but I think it's so interesting that he, that's not what he said. He didn't say, okay, you can go on your holidays now. He said, no, I'm going to give you more. How is your faith? Dodgy. <laughs> Do we have seatbelts? <laughs> so we are, um, we're halfway through 2021. We, we're just beginning the second of Sundays. Uh, you know, this first Sunday of July. And... Um, just felt like the Lord have a word for us right now. So are you okay? Are you ready? Are you sure? Okay. Thank you, Lord. Uh, well, I, I, I felt like the, the Lord told me um, that for the next 18 months, I felt like the word that he was giving me was double. Very simple, double. And uh, in 18 months, so I'm, I'm kind of a computer nerd, so I went and I typed in Google, double in 18 months. <laughs> what a nerd, huh? <laughs> and uh, what I found was that there was this, uh, this guy named Gordon Moore he was one of the founders of Intel. They're the ones that make the computer chips for a lot of computers. And back in 1965, he, uh, he made this, they call it a law. He didn't call it a law, but he, he figured that computer, the, the, amount of, um, the amount of transistors that could go onto a microchip would double every 18 to 24 months. They would double in every 18 to 24 months and that they would get cheaper. And so from that time until now, that's what's happened. Every 18 to 24 months, it's actually closer to 18 months, the, the, basically the speed of computers, they get faster, double faster every 18 months. Okay, Moore's Law, that's the, that's the summary. And they've, they've actually, they thought that it was finished, this law was finished, but now they've, they see that it's actually even getting more fast now. I think that's very interesting. Thank you, Google. Sometimes it's okay. And this is what, um, do you remember Jesus, when he, w he went early on, at the very beginning of his ministry, he went to his hometown of Nazareth, and it said that he was in synagogue, as was his practice, and he went there, and he, um, it was his turn to read the scriptures. And so he, it says that he got the scroll, and he turned it to Isaiah 61, the prophetic word. And it's the prophetic word that says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, and, and all of that. And it's, it's the year of the Lord's favor. The day of the vengeance of our God was part of that. And... Uh, if you, if you continue just a little bit after where he stopped in Luke, I believe it was, that he has it. This is a word that it says there as you continue on the reading, what his prophetic reading was. It says in verse 7, Instead of shame, there shall be a double portion. There, there's my double. Instead of shame, there shall be a double portion. In their land they shall possess a double portion. In 
the book of Exodus, chapter 22, verse 7, they, they're, you know, this is the section where God is giving Israel their law. And in this section of the scripture, in the giving of the law, it's called the law of restitution. And it's where somebody has stolen something and what's supposed to be given back. And it says, if a thief is found, he shall pay back, what do you think? Double. Double. You catch a thief stealing, if you caught him, he's supposed to give back double. Do you remember the prophet Elisha and Elijah? Elijah was the first one. Elisha was the second one. One day, Elijah came to Elisha, and he said to him, Elisha, what would you like me to give to you? And Elisha said to the prophet, I would like a double portion of your spirit to be with me. The faithful stewards, what did they do with the talents that had been entrusted to them as a responsibility given to them from God? They doubled it. You, are you starting to understand what I'm trying to get at here? Okay. Okay, I want to I want to give you something now. How's your faith? You okay, you're with me. Okay, so double. <laughs> I'm I'm like a real wor world, practical. Let's get stuff done. That's good. I'm not always, but I I li I like to think I am anyway. <laughs> and so here's some practical thoughts on this for us as a church. Normally, in a year, historically. We, we have about five to ten people give their lives to the Lord every year. So what would double be? Twenty. Water baptisms. Historically, we have about five to ten water baptisms every year. So what would double be? Twenty. In our gatherings, we have about 200 people that regularly come to Life Church. You may not get that when you're here and you only see 35 adults down here, but with kids, we have about 200. So what would double be? How's your faith? Uh, life group members in 2019 we had seven life groups so I summarized that to I think approximately 35 adults involved in life groups so double would be 70 servant leaders those are people that do stuff like make the tea and coffee run the soundboard do the computer recordings run the slides like this uh, do the kids ministry upstairs do, do all the variety of things. So we have about 50 people involved in that. So double would be 100. Community engagement. We've done stuff like food bank and um, t help with tidy towns. So just kind of summarize that one to two. Orphans supported. We support 12 orphans at least. I think there's a little bit more, but love to double that to 24. In 2019, as a church, we gave 6,750 euros uh, and I would love to double that. That would be 13,500. So those are the things that I can kind of like measure naturally. But also there are things called intangibles. Intangibles, you may not know what that word, that just means like you can't really measure it. So like the spirit of God, how do I measure? I can't really, I, there's some stuff that I am believing for double that I can't exactly put on a, in a calculator. <laughs> and, but I'm believing for double in those areas. Lives changed. Marriages restored. Kids loving their parents and honoring them. Stuff like that, you know, that we want to see a greater measure for. Heaven's touch. Fears overcome. Strongholds broken. Those kind of things. You know, I can't put it in an Excel sheet. And so I'm believing for us as a church that this will be a season of double and for us as, as families and individuals. Hallelujah. So how's your faith? <laughs> All right. I want us to read because we're in 1 Timothy. I want us to read together 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1 to 6 and verse 8 as well. It says, um, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, 
that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all. I'm not going, oops, I'm not, sorry. Who gave his life as a ransom for all which is testimony given at the proper time. Then verse 8 says, I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. I, I see in this passage of Scripture three things. Prayer, mission, and unity. Prayer, mission, and unity. I love this quote from a guy named A.W. Tozer. He says, God's looking for those to whom he can do the impossible. What a pity that we plan only the things that we can do by ourselves. How's your faith? <laughs> like, listen, I'm a pastor. That's scary for me to put up those, uh, those things, right? That's, that's intimidating. But hey... Come on, we'll, we'll walk into that. <laughs> prayer. First of all, prayer. It is impossible to fill, fulfill God's purpose without God's power. Can't do it. And one way that we access his power is through prayer. Prayer. And Paul says in these first verses, he says, first of all, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. He's like all kinds of prayers. Every church, pray all kinds of prayers. You need it. Pray for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions. Man, our leaders need prayers now. I'm telling you why that we may lead peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. Prayers help create the environment for God's purpose, his mission. Prayer helps to create the environment for God's mission. What's the environment? What's the best environment for God to fulfill his purpose, according to the first Timothy. It's a place where we can have peaceful lives, quiet lives, godly lives, dignified lives. And he prays for the leaders to help make that happen. People who are in authority that we're praying for so that we could live a life of peace, quiet, godly, dignified. The mission, the mission of God. What is the mission of God? Well, he says that here as well. He says God desires all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. Do you remember I told you last week what was the truth? The gospel, the good news. God, that people would have a relationship with God. This is what Jesus came for, to bring us back into a restore relationship so that people would have a life with God. So this is his mission, and the environment for the mission is peace, quietness, so that we can live godly and dignified lives. And uh, a godly life is an, a life that is you, where you have like a, a, an attitude of heaven. How's your attitude? Do you have a, an, uh, an attitude of the world? Or do you have an attitude of heaven? Because God wants us to have a godly life. And that's an, a life that's marked by the attitude of his type of perspective on things. Godly. And what is dignified? So godly has to do with our attitudes. Dignified has to do with our behavior. 
And so dignified is when you look at somebody and you say, whoa, what they're doing, I respect that. That's a dignified life. They're living a life that's worthy of respect. So God desires that we would live lives where our attitudes are in line with heaven and our actions are worthy of respect. Woo, hallelujah, smile at me. Come on, no. Last part, unity. He says, I desire, oh man, men. Any men out there? This is for men and women, but come on, men. I desire that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger and quarreling. Pray. When we lift our hands up, we're saying, you know, Lord, I belong to you. My life, it's a living sacrifice. I'm devoted to you. And so we pray. And one of the great hindrances to prayer is broken human relationships. You remember what Jesus said? He said, um, if you're offering your gift at the altar to God, and you remember right there that your brother has something against you, like go to him first, then come to me. Before you be praying a lot of prayers, do your best, as far as it depends on you, do your best to work things out. Sometimes we can't work it out, but as far as it depends on you, do your best to get in a right relationship with your brother, with your sister. Don't allow that because that's going to actually hinder your, your like, conversation with me. It's actually going to break down. And that can be in our marriages, between husbands and wives, friendships. It can be in the church. And so it's so important to be reconciled with each other in our lives of prayer. Anger. The ab he says, pray without anger. And the, I was reading, I was looking up the definition of this word in the Greek, and it wasn't just saying anger, it uses the word wrath, which is like um, epic, epic anger. It's like anger that has been burning for a long time. It's expansive anger. You know what I'm saying? Boiling over, yeah. When you pray, pray without anger. James 1.19 talks about anger prevention. How do I prevent getting angry? This is what he says. He says, be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Sometimes we've got to work, work at it. Be slow to become angry. It goes on to say, Ang the anger of man does not bring about the righteousness of God. There is righteous anger, but then there's the anger of man, and it doesn't bring about the righteousness of God. And the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience. Then he says, when you pray, do it without quarreling. And this is like kind of like describing like a family feud, a fa fam family fight. And I was thinking about this. You know, there's some families that can't go on a holiday together. And this is what he's kind of talking about. Like, church, don't be that family. Do not be that family. Don't quarrel. You know, it's impossible, because I'm talking about unity. It is impossible for us to agree on everything. Can I get an amen? Not a chance. I got four little kids that all have the same DNA, but they're not going to agree about everything. My wife and I are united, but we don't agree on everything. I like sushi. It's not, 
It's not possible. Never will be. We got different personalities. We got different perspectives, different experiences. It's impossible for us to be the same. So, then what's unity? Some of us, you know, live our lives kind of, um, we look at things in, in kind of shades of gray. And then others of us look at things as black and white. <laughs> ah, it's okay, don't worry, it'll be grand. How do we get along? How do we get unified? Our world, I think, I believe, people tell me that our world is more divided than ever. And Paul says, church, don't do it. Do not get caught up in that. Be united. In God's family, God's family are together. We're family. In our family, we're not fighting. We love each other. We're all different. So, Overcome it. Get over it. Have some patience. Love each other. Don't make such a big deal. If it, it, if it needs to be a big deal, then pray for them. Let's go. They're still your sister. They're still your brother. Lord, help us. So he wants us to be united. For his purpose. Okay. Will you stand up with me? Before we go, I actually have printed off um, these, uh, these papers that Heather's going to be handing out about uh, double. And it's kind of a prayer guide. What I'd like for you to take home as a prayer guide. For you to pray, pray into this for us as a church. Because I don't want, we can't just make it happen. We got to pray. We've got to pray just to make it. And so I'd love for us to unite in prayer for this word. <clears throat> and as she's doing that, I just felt like uh, I would like to close and pray for two specific areas. So will you look at me? I know she's going around. Will you just look at me for a second? Uh, I want us to pray about two areas. The first area is I spoke about these two words, constricted and expansive. And so I would like to pray for those of us who feel like we've actually gotten to the place where we've been constricted. And we kind of even maybe even thought it was a little bit from the Lord for us to get smaller. And if, if you'd like to respond to that and um, respond that, Actually, the Lord wants you to open up, begin to open up, begin to see him for who he is. Then I would like you to just put a hand in your heart if, if you feel that's a word for you. It's because our God is a God of abundance. He's a God of generosity. He's a God of growth. And so, Father, those who have their hands on their heart today, Father, we pray that you touch us, that you enable us to walk into the life that you have for us, Lord. That the, the, the phrase that I'm using is that he would establish us for increase. Lord, I pray that you would establish us for increase. Establish us in you in order for increase to come as you desire. Now, the second um, thing that I would like to pray for is uh, anger and quarreling to move in us into unity. And, uh, you know, if you just want to put your, if that's you, you, you know, you see some of that maybe going on in, in your own heart. 
that you put your hand on your heart today. And uh, God desires unity in his family. Psalm 133 says, how good and pleasing it is when brothers dwell together in unity. It's like when the oil runs down the priest. It's like when the dew is on the mountains. There is a, the, it's, a, it's, a it's a picture of the Holy Spirit. It's a place where the Holy Spirit comes, and it's a place where there's fruitfulness. When there's unity, and it actually ends that psalm, David says, there, where the brothers dwell together in unity, there is where the Lord commands a blessing. And so, Heavenly Father, those who are responding to you today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, we break the power of the enemy, Lord God, over division. Lord, the enemy is a thief, he is a liar. He is a deceiver, Lord, but you have come that we may have life and have it more abundantly. Lord, and I pray that we would pursue unity, God, what you desire. Lord, that we would throw off the lies of the enemy in Jesus' name. So we break that power, Lord God, of lies, of, of confusion, of distrust. Lord, and we, we pray, Lord God, Holy Spirit, you empower us to be united, Lord God, to, to listen to one another, to love one another, God, to honor each other. Lord, thank you that your blessing would rest upon us, Lord. Thank you, you release us from constriction, you release us from anger and quarreling. Thank you, Lord, come. And Lord, we thank you, God, for what you're doing, Lord. Thank you. you. You destroy what's not meant to be in order to build us up. Father, we thank you. And we lift up this, this word of double. Lord, I thank you for every family here, that they would experience double in faithfulness, fruitfulness, provision, joy, protection, health, courage, favor, and heaven's touch. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.